Welcome to the Summit Series. I'm Ari Melbourne. Today I am joined by a technologist, entrepreneur, and the CEO who took Google public, Eric Schmidt. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Ari. I'm so happy to be part of the show. Uh, really great to have you. We talked to folks at the summit of their fields. You've been at the summit of more than one. Right now, you're very focused on artificial intelligence. How do you define that term? So artificial intelligence is generally understood as human-like intelligence done by computers. I define it as systems that are learning because the key characteristic of humans is that we can learn. If you've got a system that's learning and evolving, you have an AI-based system that's interesting. Learning sounds good, and that can obviously solve problems or potentially create them. Uh, you've been called upon by the United States government, the Pentagon, among others, to figure out how to make this a good thing more than a, a danger. I want to play for you just some of the people at the top of these fields talking about AI. Take a listen. Google, um, Facebook, Apple, Microsoft are all moving ahead uh, at a great speed in improving this artificial intelligence software. So it's very exciting. One person could p punch a button at the start of every morning and all the goods and services that we're getting now would be turned out by robots. It promises to create a vastly more productive and efficient economy. The way we think about AI uh, is colored by popular culture and by science fiction. The idea that there's going to be a general AI overlord that subjugates us or kills us all, I think is not something to worry about. We have to figure out some way to ensure that the advent of digital superintelligence is one which is symbiotic with humanity. Are you as generally optimistic as they are about it? I am, and the reason is that the arrival of computer intelligence that's similar to human intelligence is going to have huge implications for science and medicine, drug discovery, making systems more efficient, making us smarter, learning things quicker, answering questions that have bedeviled humans for thousands of years. We know this will happen. We also believe, and that's why we wrote the book, Age of AI, um, is that it'll have a lot of implications on society, which we should start discussing right now. What are you most concerned about and within what you can say, what are you telling the government and the Pentagon to get ahead of or to avoid? Well, I was uh, fortunate enough to be the chairman of a national AI commission from the Congress over the last three years, and I worked for the Defense Department for five looking at AI. And the summary of what our report says, it's uh, nscai.gov, you can read it, it's 756 pages, it's exhaustive, <laughs> is that uh, the real thing going on now is that there's a competition between China and the West. China has decided to invest in AI, quantum, uh, synthetic biology, energy systems. These are all the things that I care about. As a matter of national policy, they're putting enormous amounts of money in it. And they're beginning to catch up and in some cases exceed what the West is doing. I want Western platforms. I want the Western values to be the ones that are reflected in the platforms that we use. In our report, we say many things, including increasing R&D funding, working with our partners, helping with education and all of that kind of stuff, getting ready for the transformation of AI. So from a national security perspective, AI will transform it fundamentally. And there are all sorts of problems. Uh, you can imagine situations where you have a proliferation problem, where there's some dangerous AI system that you don't want to proliferate. We don't understand how to do detente in the form that was form formed under nuclear uh, weapons doctrines. We don't have any concept of how to conduct diplomacy mm. in the presence of artificial intelligence systems. I can go on and on. We're not ready for this revolution. And the revolution is at the scale of the age of reason. That's how profound AI is going to be in our society. And what's the timeline for this? Well, people disagree. Um, if you talk to the optimists, if you will, they'll say you're gonna have general intelligence, human intelligence within 15 years. The pessimists say it will either be never or a very long time from now. The median, by the way, of all those estimates is about 20 years. So if you just ask me, I'll say November 20, 2041, because it's 20 years from now. Nobody really knows. Well, good. it's good to get the date, though. I think now that we we have the date, that's helpful for everyone <laughs> to have an exact time. The, the, 
the remarks from Barack Obama, who, who you have uh, spoken with, and we'll get to that, reflect the, the fact that people who aren't steeped in this like yourself and who aren't technological makers uh, get their cues on this from pop culture or Black Mirror or what have you. But one of the larger concerns is that if you mix this sort of self-perpetuating or self-improving system, its information or its processing, with some sort of vaguely stated creation, that it can then eventually just do things on its own. Uh, how real is that, or how much of that is just from our movies? Well, at the moment, it's from movies. Um, today, the important thing about AI is it does not have its own volition. It still requires com humans to tell it what to look for. In other words, it doesn't have its own independent creative judgment. It can't say, I want to go study physics, or I want to go do art. It can be told to do physics and told to do art, but it can't decide it on its own. Many people think that we will cross that boundary. And at the point when the system can decide what it wants to work on, it's a whole new ballgame. Uh, and that's what leads to Elon Musk's comments and so forth. He calls it the super intelligence. Because once it can decide what it wants to work on, it can also probably accelerate faster than human thought because it can collect and, and operate it as a, if you will, in a hive of information. We don't really know. This is the matter of scientific speculation. What we do know is that, uh, I'll give you an example. Physicists will have physicist assistants that will read all the information and make suggestions to the physicist. The doctor will read all your medical re records and make suggestions for how to care for you. We'll use uh, biological systems to generate candidate drugs and they'll go through hundreds of millions of combinations that humans couldn't do to pick a drug that might work. In our book, The Age of AI, we mention a drug called Halicin, which MIT designed using a supercomputer. And what it did is they looked for drugs that would be broad antibiotics, but would not produce the antibiotic resistance that we have to traditional antibiotics. And they found one named Halicin. That's a major achievement. Another example, um, uh, DeepMind has a subsidiary that, work, that produce something called AlphaFold. AlphaFold is the essentially how do proteins fold? This is a Nobel Prize winning discovery, in my opinion, mm. because we've looked for years for how do proteins work. If we understand how they fold, which is a complicated calculation, we can know how to apply them to stop things and start things in biology, to stop a disease, start a, re a remedy, start growth, those sorts of things. Yeah, it's far out. Your work here also is in a different organizational context, doing things through a commission, as mentioned with the government, uh, when most of your background is in technology and the sort of initially startup or early tech space. A lot of your peers uh, are very proud of, of those results and tend to be quite dismissive uh, of government or public sector or other older models. I I'm curious your take on that and specifically is there anything positive that you saw working through bureaucracies or with the Defense Department uh, as compared to the, the tech and business space? Or do you stay in that group that says, hey, it's, it works a lot faster and better uh, on the private sector side? In my five years working for the Defense Department, I developed an extraordinary respect for what I view as real heroes of our nation. I also developed an enormous distaste for the system that was erected around them, mm. where they have very little freedom. They have very little opportunity to really drive things. Um, the notion of innovation is sort of counter to the way their system was designed, and they're stuck in it. So it's really impressive people trapped in a system that really needs to be rethought. Um, if you take a look, we don't get the money value that we for the money that we put in not because the people aren't good, but because they're not allowed to run the way we run. They're not allowed to run quickly. They're not allowed to innovate. They're not allowed to take risks. So let me, let me jump in because you're, you're making such an interesting point. You, you say the system, uh, which makes you sound perhaps more like a radical and less like the billionaire you are or the way people think of billionaires. But a lot of folks agree with you. And they, they look at even experiments, say DARPA, or experiments that have tried to innovate in the government, uh, but still feel stultified. Do you, as someone who's been effective in organizations, do you see any great 
solution to that in modernizing government that we're not currently looking at? Or is it the nature of accountable democratic government that it's going to be like this? Well, I came to the view that our government is operating in a low trust environment of each other. And partly it's because there's so many people transferring through. So if you go back and you look at a mistake that was made 10 years ago, and you look for accountability, you know, in other words, do you want to hold the person who made the mistake? Do you want to teach them or fire them? They've already left. Mm -hmm. And so the system judgment is not as good as the individual judgment of somebody who takes ownership. So if we want to sort of reform the way government works, we have to be willing to take the following risks. We have to be willing to put really competent people in charge and let them run and let them make mistakes. If you make a mistake in a government, you get fired. If you do nothing, you don't get fired. Right. So it becomes an incredibly risk averse system. So is that- Again, this is a system problem, not a person problem. Do you view that structurally as the opposite of an effective firm or startup where basically the, the dynamic you just described would ideally be the opposite? It's exactly the inverse. And uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, manufacturing in America now does things called digital twins. And the digital twin is a way where the development team builds a software version of the hardware and they simulate the whole thing and then they make one. And then based on that, they work with their suppliers and then they eventually make something which they can make a lot of. Everything I just described to you is essentially illegal because the way our procurement works is you have to give somebody a large award and they have to specify and win the award without actually prototyping it and learning from building the prototypes. Mm. When they get that done, they can't actually proceed because their competitor who lost sues them for two years. So that an, adds another two years. People have studied the large weapon systems problem in the military, and the average large weapon system takes about 17 years. So the F-35, for example, which is in many cases a very impressive airplane, was designed in 2001, many years before the smartphone. No surprise that they had all sorts of computer problems and so forth, because it was specified with a technology generation that was essentially archaic in yeah. my world. You would never run a business that way. So the way business works is it has a very clear objective. It's obviously governed by laws, and it, the business takes risks. Government cannot seem to be able to take these risks. We need a, so to solve this problem, because there's lots of money in this system, we need a compact between the Congress, both the appropriators and the essentially the, the, the armed services committees that actually approve the strategies and, and the contractors and the military themselves to run things differently. We don't yet have that agreement. It's a really interesting analysis that you offer. It also explains why every time I fly an F-35, I can't even get my Google Maps to work on there, you know, no plug-in. But, but in all seriousness, you're saying something that's fundamentally non-ideological, if I'm hearing you right. You're talking about how to make something effective, although people may hear it or correlate it with certain more political criticisms of the federal government, but you're really just talking about making it work well. Um, I, I want our government to be efficient and effective, and I don't want to waste money. Uh, I was proud to help our military. I'm not a particularly pro-military person, but I think our military is important, and I want them to be effective mm -hmm. at what they do. Uh, what has ultimately happened in our military system is that because of the complicated set of overlaps and because of this natural conservatism, we've ended up taking supply chains in terms of design and making them two or three times longer. That, that eats up an enormous amount of cost and makes them less effective. Yeah. There's so many innovations. There's so many innovations that our government could use. And, and I'll give you a, a, a really good example is that uh, there's something called the littoral combat ship, which was designed in the late 90s. And the idea was that this was a ship that would be operate near to shore. Well, in 20 years, the range of missiles of our opponents have gotten that you can't put ships near the shore. So the whole concept was wrong. Hmm. But the people who invented this and approved this and so forth are no longer around to either fire or learn from or change what they do. Because the decision cycles are so long, you make mistakes, and they're expensive. Really interesting. I mentioned Barack Obama. You actually interviewed him when he was a candidate uh, before becoming president. Let's take a quick look. Senator, you're here at Google, and I like to think of the presidency as a, as a job interview. It's also hard to get a job at Google. Right. We, um, and obviously, Google is uh, you know, a symbol of one sector of our economy that's just been extraordinary. Innovative, creative, and lucrative. <laughs> um, 
But there's a whole other part of America that has been left behind. What did you learn about him? What do you think of his ongoing concern about a digital divide? And how does he stack on tech compared to the two presidents who came after? Um, well, I had the privilege of serving as a presidential science advisor under President Obama, so my biases should be very clear. Um, this, that president, President Obama, understood the opportunity of, of essentially agility of technology. And although he was con con consumed with all the normal issues of the presidency, when we would meet with him, uh, he understood what we were doing at a level that was really extraordinary. And that's just because he's such a gifted man. Um, with respect to the digital divide, uh, I keep saying to my colleagues, you're so good at building systems that do A, B, or C. Why don't we build systems that actually lift people up? Why don't we identify a category of people who are not doing as well as we are? And why don't we figure out a way to increase their salaries or increase their knowledge or increase their job opportunities rather than working on all these other things? It's so easy for my community to go and solve problems that we have but, but we tend to be the ones who are privileged. We tend to be the ones who got into the best schools or get the best opportunities. What about everyone else? The president, that is President Obama, cared a great deal about that. On the economic divide, which it relates, uh, you have done philanthropy, continue to do it. Uh, you have benefited from your time at Google, although so did the shareholders. That's the traditional argument. But much of your compensation came through stock, which made you a billionaire, do you think that should be taxed fundamentally as income? Uh, I don't know enough about tax policy to have a subtle answer to this. I would tell you that for someone in my situation, you don't take it with you when you're gone, so you're going to give it away. So as long, I don't actually care what they do on the tax side. That's up for the experts. But I do want an opportunity to use the, the great wealth that was created by Google um, to work on the things that I care about, which are largely in the area of science. What I realized in, when I looked backward in my own history is that I was standing on the shoulders of giants, people who had built these platforms, the physicists who invented what are semiconductors and all of that. And when you're young and you think you're sort of incredibly powerful and so forth, you don't realize how much you owe to the people who built the platform behind you. If you look at yourself and you look at the, uh, MSNBC, Look at the giants that built the organizations that you're now part of. We always forget the contribution and how hard it was for them to do it. I want to honor them, but more importantly, I want to create the next generation. I will tell you, and I learned this at Google, and I can tell you in my current work, the talent that is coming up now in the American system and globally, but in particular in the American universities, is so much smarter, so much quicker, so much more capable than I ever was. The sooner we can put them in charge, as far as I'm concerned, the better. Google provides a lot of informational value around the world, including to a lot of people who may not have very much if they can access it, uh, and has done that in organizing a whole range of information over years. Social media, which is very profitable and ubiquitous, seems to be a little more of an entertaining distraction. Do you think it provides the same value uh, at this point in, in tech? It may in the future, I'm not sure it does today. When we focused on Google, what we tried to do is answer people's questions as best we could using ranking and we built an advertising system so the system was free. And I'm enormously proud of my collaboration with our founders, Larry and Sergey, and what we did. The issue with social media is roughly the following. Social media, these are businesses and their job is to maximize shareholder return and revenue. And the best way to maximize revenue is to maximize engagement. And the best way to maximize engagement in social media is with outrage, literally outrage on the left or the right. And so if you assume that people, there's a sort of center and some people who are center left and some people are center right, and then there's right wing extreme and left wing extreme, assume that simple polarizing model, these systems naturally push you to the extremes. And they do so for engagement reasons not because of some moral or social reason. That problem is an unsolved problem, and we need to address it, and we need to figure out a way so that these companies can be profitable companies without driving us insane. <laughs> and furthermore, I would tell you that, that AI is going to make this much worse, because if I were sort of an evil founder type, which hopefully I'm not, 
What I would do is build a social network that knew so much about you by getting you to give me that information that I could target the information precisely to your personal biases, political beliefs, and literally, you know, duplicative strategies or uh, uh, duplicitous strategies. And so what I would do is I would figure out that for this person, for Susie and for John and for Mike and so forth, each of them would have their own feed, which would be designed to match maximize one thing, which is their engagement. And everyone is slightly different. And that would maximize my revenue, but it would terrify the world because that's not how human societies work. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating and horrifying uh, as you lay it out. I hope people understand what you're saying and the expertise behind it. And you're also issuing it as a warning. Broadly, what, what percent of our current divisions do you think are a product or amplified by this social media situation? Well, maybe this is my own bias, but I think that the tools are driving us to this outcome. Um, there's a quote from E.O. Wilson that I looked up. He's a very famous uh, uh, biologist. And his answer was, the real problem in humanity is the following. We have paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike technology. <laughs> This was said 10 years ago. And I think it's exactly correct that what's happening is these technologies are pulsing our human emotions, our human structure. We know, and I learned this when I was at Google, that a video, right, even if it's false, even if I tell you this video is false and you see it, it will change your behavior. That's just a human thing. And we're not going to change that kind of human behavior, in, certainly in my generation. So we've got to come up with some agreements, and these are really moral agreements. I'm not arguing about detailed regulation, about, I'll use the technical term, what is the objective function? What are we trying to do? At Google, when Larry and Sergey and I were fa uh, faced these questions, we, we had our equivalent was improving quality. And we could either improve quality or we could give more revenue to our shareholders. And I arbitrarily made the decision that we would do half to our quality and half to our shareholders. How did I come up with 50-50? I made it up. But that's an example of an accommodation between mm -hmm. maximizing revenue and producing what was essentially a bad product versus making some gains for our shareholders as well as improving the quality of our product. I don't see that behavior enough on social media services. I think that if you look at the Facebook leaks, it indicates that internally they understood these trade-offs, but they didn't act on them for reasons I don't understand. Really fair. And on Facebook, their vision of a more immersive virtual digital experience, whether that's their meta brand or some other type, looks to you as a probable future reality or unlikely? I think it's highly likely, and it's usually not in the way that people like me describe it when you start. So what will happen, uh, the, the technical structure is the following. Uh, the multiverse uh, or metaverse, as it's just discussed, has been around for 30 or 40 years. I've seen various proposals in my whole career. And the idea is that you'll spend quite a bit of time in that world, immersed in it for gaming reasons, for education reasons, for commerce reasons, or because you're lonely or learning something. And many people think that this will really happen. Uh, Facebook, of course, has made a major bet in this with Oculus. Most people believe that this universe will be primarily consumed on phones and other kinds of screen devices, and that the VR, AR headsets will come in later. That's a question, you can argue that either way. But the important point is, will you stop spending your day looking around the room and instead spend your day looking at a screen in a world where you and your friends are younger, smarter, more beautiful, more handsome, faster, and more in consumed, and will there be drama that will be exciting to you in a narrative that causes you to spend more time there than in your real world? I, I have a friend who has three young children, and he read the book, and he talked to me about this, and he said, you know, the problem I have with your argument is I have three young kids who I love very much, and they are really, really a handful. Maybe I should not have had those three children, and instead I should be living in this metaverse where I wouldn't have to do all the work I have to do now. And I thought, you know, his point is well taken. If we create a world that is so seductive that people stop doing the essential things we need for humans to do, which starts with having children and making families and all of that, that's a pretty big change in our society. Uh, I'll give you another example. 
uh, you have a small child and the small child gets a toy and the toy is AI enabled. And that toy, you know, learns and gets better and the kid learns and gets better. And now they're teenagers. And uh, that is the bear and the toy or whatever it is. And the kid and their best friends. Best friend is, is an inanimate object. And that toy is watching television and says to the kid, you know, I don't like this show. And the kid says, I agree with you. How do you feel about that? So now let's imagine a scenario where this is a learning toy and the, and the toy, in this case, say a bear, nudges the kid with the, his or her elbow and says, I just learned something. Would you like to know? The kid's going to say, sure. How do we know that what the kid learns from this toy is appropriate in the eyes of the government, the parents, the educators, and so forth? The systems that we're building, and we say this very precisely in the book, are imprecise, they're dynamic, they change a lot, they're emergent, you combine them and they do things that you don't expect, but most importantly, they're continuously learning. We've never had an intelligence like that to contend with as humans. It will really call into the question, what does it mean to be human? Well, our self-identity is we're the liberal artists, we're the, we're the people who have grand visions, we're the age of reason, we're the people who think about these grand principles. What happens if there's another intelligence which is thinking about those sorts of things? And what happens if that other intelligence thinks differently in such a way that we as humans cannot comprehend it and it can't explain itself? How will we treat it? Dr. Kissinger in the book says in that scenario in history, societies either take up arms against it, right, or invent a new religion that explains it. Right. Which one will it be? It's fascinating, and you say new religion, and much of this comes back to the existential questions, as you put it, of what does it mean to be human, what is real, and what do we want to do with our departures from reality? Uh, a glass of wine or a trip is one thing. People who depart completely from reality with substances are often seen as having an addiction problem, even if they say that place is more enjoyable or is a release, and to the extent that an immersive technology can become that, as you say, it really depends what its North Star is. Uh, you've been generous with your time. I'd love to do a lightning round, or if you had any final thought on that before we go to the lightning round. Well, what I was going to add, add was uh, there's a movie called Ready Player One, um, which is an example where in a very tough dystopian world, people retreat to a virtual world, and the, the, the movie is just a fun movie. But it's the first movie that really captured this notion of crossing over. And I wonder when you become older and when the kids are grown and when you're sort of tired of work or you're retired or whatever it is, would you really prefer to spend your time imagining and looking at pictures of your grandchildren? Or would you really prefer to spend your time crossed over into this virtual world where your ailments don't exist and where your friends are all as quick as they could ever be and where there's drama and excitement and friends, I might, as I get older, prefer that. We'll see. But that technology is coming. We don't understand, we, let me say it precisely, we did not understand when we started the social media activities, the level of impact that it would have on governments and on people, and in particular, manipulating people against objectives of one person or another through amplification, crisis and so forth and so on. We just didn't understand it. I don't want us to make the same mistake with AI. I want us to have teams that are more than just computer scientists. I want ethicists, I want economists, I want biologists, I want all the people of civil society to work on what are the right ethics for these systems. I'm not talking about regulation, I'm talking about what are the guidelines? What is appropriate, what is not appropriate? We have to figure that out from the standpoint of both how, what it means to be human, but how do we do, do diplomacy? How do we do negotiations? How do countries and terrorist groups, in fact, interact with each other? What is appropriate, what is not? But to follow up on that with some of the other points you've made, doesn't that also go back to the tension of if businesses and startups are the one driving this, uh, and you just walked us through why they drive it better than government, uh, move faster, 
have all these people and they operate in a system that fundamentally is about their fiduciary duty to deliver shareholder value. If you don't change that organizing premise of capitalism with which neither party in the American mainstream is talking about uh, and it's delivered other benefits that people uh, seem to like, not want to change, then everything you're talking about would be the window dressing, the nice thing to add, the board's idea of, well, well, sure, let's try a little bit of that, but it would never be driving the fundamental outcomes in a competitive capitalist system. Is that, is that fair? Um, it's a bit too extreme, and here's why. Today's CEOs and today's at least Western capitalists are constrained by many things besides um, the, the raw pursuit of economic earnings and shareholder value. The old model was the corporation is only goal with shareholder value, but that's not true anymore. You have to satisfy the needs of your employees and your customers and regulators. You have to have a high quality standing. You wanna be able to have an impact. You have to have a good reputation. These are all things which are not as hard, they're hard to write down in rules, but they're easy to express in values. We need a renaissance of understanding what the values of these new AI-based systems will be and how will they operate with humans? What will be appropriate and what will not be? Where should learning occur and where should not learning occur? How do we handle bias? All of these things which are hard to regulate but very important to get right. And let's start working on that now. Well, one more question on that then. Another distinction at the broadest level with Google and much of the social media is that the proposition and business goal itself was to deliver accurate or relevant results. And people can quibble with that and you know far more about it than us. But that seems like a different and fundamentally better goal than what you just described some of the social media companies doing, which is only trying to sate or intensify base emotions. And they need to come, they need to answer the question, what's their ethic? Right, so one ethic is what we're really trying to do is to educate the world. Another one is we're trying to entertain the world. At the moment, what we're doing, what they are doing collectively, is they're busy confusing the world um, because the incentives are not in alignment. The more money they make, the more they drive people crazy. We've got to get that hmm. fixed somehow. Yeah. Uh, lightning round is something we ask people to do. It's in a word or a sentence, although you can go longer if you need. Uh, some people sometimes pass. Uh, we'll see how you do, but it's it's lightning, word or a sentence, starting with, in a word, artificial intelligence is. Exciting and scary. Larry Page. Brilliant. Sergey Brin. Brilliant. Bill Gates. Brilliant. <laughs> a theme. Uh, Steve Jobs. Even more brilliant. Of all of the people that I have worked with, Steve is the one that is the greatest sort of human achievement and loss of all because of his early death. The fact that he could invent and vision and see the world at such a young age is extraordinary. He's missed every day. Hmm. Jeff Bezos. Uh, similarly brilliant. Imagine coming out of computer science in his case and setting up a bookstore that becomes this extraordinarily scale company. It's a fantastic achievement. He'll do that in history. Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, similar. I worry with Mark that he learned the lessons from Bill Gates and others about the pursuit of his corporation, and he forgot some of these other principles. We'll see. Sheryl Sandberg. Uh, worked at Google, uh, a really fantastic uh, executive, well-trained at Google, did for many years the most powerful woman in America, quite an achievement. Anne Wojcicki. Uh, she, Anne is now the uh, founder of 23andMe. And if you look, she's one of the first people who managed to get digital technology into the healthcare system at scale. Hmm. Elon Musk. Uh, maybe more brilliant than all of them combined. If you really? look at his yeah, over if you look jobs, at, maybe. If you look at what Elon did, he did everything right technologically, but he did one other thing. 
which is that he took enormous risk in a business that required billions of dollars of capital. And remember when Tesla was near bankruptcy, and now it's an extraordinarily near trillion dollar corporation. Very, very few people in my entire life have been able to combine that amount of risk tolerance as well as technological brilliance. It's very rare to have both. Well, now I got to ask you, do you think he had that risk tolerance because personally he just didn't care? Or did he care and override what is usually for most people the type of human fear that holds you back? I've known and worked with him for many years. You cannot tell. <laughs> what I do know is that he, that he, you cannot tell his internal calculation. What you can know is that he is willing to bet to the fences with not only his own money and his own wealth, nearly bankrupting himself, but also he was very, very good at using government money. Um, so Tesla and SpaceX are really good examples where the government provided some important initial capital and important initial markets. And then two very mature markets were entered by a newcomer and they upended the market. That's an achievement. That's extraordinarily rare in American business. Mm. Bill Campbell. Bill Campbell was the greatest coach, in my view, that ever lived. Bill uh, coached Steve Jobs and myself. In fact, I felt so strongly about him that we wrote a book called Trillion Dollar Coach. And what we argued was that, Bill, we didn't understand it until after his death. He wasn't coaching us as individuals. He was coaching the whole team. And what our book is about is that teams, that is the business of businesses, our team businesses, need a, a team coach. And our book is about his lessons, which are time immemorial. Kissinger. If I were 98, <laughs> I would want to be Dr. Kissinger. He gets up in the morning, uh, and even with the ailments of his age, he works so incredibly hard. At the age of 92, he mastered a whole new field, a field for which he had no training except a historian's mind. And he got into it because he was studying Kant, and Kant was studied a great deal, the question of reality and the perception of reality. And in those six or seven years he's been in AI, he's become one of the greatest forces articulating the issues of AI. It is an extraordinary achievement at any age, but imagine doing it when you're 98. Mm. Uh, and finally, a couple sentences. I knew I'd made it when? I knew I'd made it when I was able in the late 90s to give talks about the internet that literally tens of thousands of people would be delighted by. And I knew I'd made it when I was riding a wave that was gonna to touch everyone and I was early. Hmm. It's important in your career to find something which is about to explode and ride that wave with it. I thought it was over when? Uh, in the first year of Google, I had just joined the company and the company was out of money. And we had a deal that we were trying to do with AOL and we couldn't agree to what the deal should be. And I panicked and I thought I've made the wrong decision. Hmm. And of course I was thankfully wrong. The wildest thing about this super successful widely believed to be intelligent person, Eric Schmidt, the wildest thing about you uh, that people would be surprised by? I go to Burning Man every year. Every year? What did you learn at Burning Man? Uh, B Burning Man is a good example of forming a temporary city and letting people be creative and follow their own instincts. I worry that in our society, we become so uh, weak need, if you will, that we're not willing to tolerate the eccentricities, the creativity, and the disagreements among people. I feel very strongly that human freedom is valuable and we need to protect it. Awesome. Failure means? In my world, failure means put your pants on the next morning and start again. It is remarkable that the American system not only encourages that, but will allow you to raise billions of dollars after failure. Thank God for America. Success means? 
more success. People who are successful tend to create the success around them. And they do so because of uniquely human aspects such as drive, charisma, and luck. The biggest and most important thing you have in your life is luck. The luck of your birth, the luck of your parents, the luck of your education, the luck of your time. If I'd been born 100 years ago, I wouldn't be able to be on this with you and you wouldn't be on this with me. I wouldn't be able to enjoy this. It would be different. Mm -hmm. And finally, reaching the summit means? There's a point when you're successful, when you realize that you're at the top. And I don't mean the tippy top. I mean that the people that you're with are also winners. It is incredibly satisfying when you are successful at the summit to realize that there's other summits and hanging out with the other summiteers is the most fun ever. <laughs> You've been very generous with your time. Uh, you're a busy person. I think we've learned a lot. Eric Schmidt, thank you for joining me on the Summit Series. Thank you, Ari. And I look forward to seeing this and seeing you soon. Thanks again. Absolutely. Appreciate it.